Thanks, Gina. All right, thank you everyone for coming to today's presentation on project outcome for academic libraries. Um, my name is Sarah Gurk. I'm Mellon ACLS Public Fellow and Program Manager at ACRL. And with me today are Emily Plowman from the Public Library Association, where she manages PLA's Project Outcome Toolkit, and Mary O'Kelly from Western Michigan University and a member of our Project Outcome for Academic Libraries Task Force that helped develop the new toolkit. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up yet, um, what, we're be, what we'll be talking about today is available at acrl.projectoutcome.org. It only takes a couple minutes to sign up. And if you experience any problems in the registration process, please email us at acrl.projectoutcome.org. And it will probably, probably be Gina, who you just heard um, on the call, who um, helps you sort out any issues you might have. So we're curious to know how many of you had heard of Project Outcome before signing up for this webinar. If you could just click on the raise hand icon. Okay, it looks like about maybe about half of attendees, which is great. So hopefully whether you've heard of Project Outcome um, or not, you will learn something new from what we'll be sharing with you today. So today's session is about um, how Project Outcome can help you measure learning outcomes in your library. Um, we'll also talk you through what's available to you in the toolkit from administering surveys to visualizing your results, um, and then give you some ideas for how you can put that data to work in improving your library services and advocating for your library. And we also want to make sure, of course, that we answer any questions that you have and that you know how to get in touch with us if you have any future questions. So please do um, type in the chat box if you have any questions as we go along. We'll take a minute at, to pause at a couple points um, to make sure we address those questions and make sure we get them all um, at the end as well. So today we're going to start by talking about the foundational basis of this toolkit, what it means to be measuring impact and the outcome measures uh, for academic libraries that the task force developed. I'll be taking you through what's in the toolkit itself um, and the outcome measurement process that you can use to engage in. Um, Mary will be talking about her work with the task force and at her library, and we'll close out by um, get, hopefully giving you a few ideas about how you can get started taking action using the results um, you get. And as I said, we'll be sure to um, take time to answer your questions along the way. So if you haven't yet had a chance to visit the site, this is what you'll see on the home page. Project Outcome for Academic Libraries is a free toolkit for academic and research librarians and LIS students, and it's designed to help academic libraries understand and share the impact of essential library services and programs by providing simple surveys and an easy to use process for measuring and analyzing outcomes. It also provides libraries with resources and training support to help you apply your results and advocate for your library's future. And I want to especially emphasize that this toolkit is for everyone, um, not only for people with assessment in their job titles or descriptions, and it was explicitly designed to relate to the widest possible range of library services and roles. Project Outcome for Academic Libraries is based on a model developed and tested by the Public Library Association, which has been in the field for about three years now. PLA currently has over 200,000 responses in the system and over 1,400 participating public libraries. Um, ACRL, our numbers are a bit, a bit lower now, but we've only been out in the field for about two weeks, so we've got some time to catch up. So I'm gonna turn this over to Emily to talk about um, PLA's work on Project Outcome. And thanks, Sarah. I know, um, I know ACRL's toolkit has only been out for two weeks, but to see 278 responses collected so far is just amazing. And I think that really speaks to the academic field's interest and desire to have this kind of outcome measurement product um, accessible and available to them. So, you know, the next slide that I'm going to talk about really probably should already feel um, true to you if you're on uh, if you're on today's call. Um, you know, you're, we're hearing that libraries are needing more data, needing more evidence of value, and that the regular metrics that you all might be collecting aren't going as far as they used to. And when the Public Library Association developed for this for the uh, public library field, that was certainly the reason why uh, we started to work to bring this product to our market. We had heard from public libraries that 
they were being outcompeted when it came to talking about library value and, and that they weren't being able to get as much funding as they used to because they were seeing gain count numbers going down or maybe collection use going down, but they knew that the library was just as relevant as ever, if not more relevant, because it was now being directed to do more community facing activity. And I think a lot of that holds true for the academic side too. Um, there's this need for more expanded data and there's also just a lot of work that you've been doing for a long time that could be really amplified with more data and evidence. But when we created the toolkit, what we really wanted to do is develop something that was that was easy and accessible for uh, library staff of all types. So this isn't just a toolkit for assessment professionals, as I'm sure Sara will demonstrate in coming slides. Um, this is really designed to help it be help libraries measure outcomes easier at a time when they have a variety of different needs that they're trying to meet, when they might have resource or staff limitations, and they uh, might also have staff that they're working with that don't have um, a clear understanding of what it is that they're trying to measure. So at a very basic level, when we're trying to help libraries measure outcomes, uh, we've come up with a definition here that really focuses on this idea that we're helping you gather data about the changes that an individual perceives in themselves when they interact with the library, either a library program or a library service. And usually there's an assumption that there's some kind of staff intervention as well. Um, but basically what you're trying to do is answer the question, what good did we do? And you're asking this from the patron or student or faculty perspective. You're not trying to predict what good you did. You're not trying to do some kind of observation and make that determination yourself. You're just really going directly to that learner and saying, what did you do? How did you make a change as a result of using this library service? How did you change as a result of staff support? Um, and then, you know, really focusing on kind of that that meaningful and achievable data that you can gather about what that patron tells you they've done, how they've changed. And we're not saying that you should be getting rid of all other types of measurement. There's certainly a lot of other measurement that's out there that you can still be, that still has a lot of value and you can still be doing. Um, outcomes are really, again, just focusing on that, what good did we do? But you can also be g gathering data around patron satisfaction, needs assessment, and still I'm guessing most of you will be collecting some of that really core output data around collection and usage. However, what we set up and what we really try and focus on when we really, when we're pushing out the project outcome toolkit is that we want libraries to take out, take action using their data. And so again, at a very kind of base level and entry, um, format. What we do is we focus on how we can get libraries to think about taking action before they're even starting to collect the data. We don't want you collecting data and then having it sit on a shelf. And when we talk about and when we're introducing the outcome measurement concept to libraries, the key activities that we see happening from libraries that have successfully used outcome data for action are really tied to taking data to potential funders or existing funders to make the case for expanding new funding. We really commonly see libraries being able to take this data and make really simple, sudden, uh, no cost programming decisions to just improve programming implement uh, step by step. Uh, we see a lot of new partnerships formed around outcome data because it's really easy to see in the data if there's maybe a deficit in what you're offering as a, um, a learning need. And if you don't have the capability to offer that uh, content yourself, that's a great opportunity to identify a new partnership. And the data definitely can be used for advocacy, communication, uh, new funding requests, just a whole host of opportunities uh, to be able to just build up the library's value when it comes to talking to your leadership or talking to your board or just when communicating with your uh, community or other stakeholders. Uh, so with that, I'd love to hear from you all in chat, um, again, by selecting, making sure that your drop down menu says all panelists and attendees. Is your library already measuring outcomes, some way, outcomes in some way? Is there another type of evaluation that you're doing? And what might be a barrier to measuring outcomes or evaluation in your library? So I'm going to go ahead and give you a few seconds to start uh, sharing some of that information in chat. We'd love to hear what you all are doing.
And as we're uh, waiting for the chat to start coming through, um, a couple of things that we heard very commonly when we launched this at ACRL was, you know, kind of challenges around staff support um, and time limitations and maybe not consistently measuring data. So um, I see measuring for accredit accreditation groups, no real barrier, but time consuming. Yep. Annual patron satisfaction, not currently measuring, but hoping to. Uh, retention studies, not measuring yet. Uh, very little outcome measurement. Various librarians using different assessment instructions to measure lit instruction. Great. Um, and trying to assess student learning better. I see that there are a fair amount of you using different evaluation tools that you um, might already have access to, LibWizard, LibInsight, uh, maybe LibQual, I see that being populated in here. Um, time as a barrier, that's definitely, you know, that's definitely out there. You're competing with time. Um, anytime you bring a new activity on into your system. I think what you'll see from the project outcome is we try to reduce the time barrier as much as possible. You're still administering surveys, but we have a lot of ready to go uh, resources for you to help you out. Um, and the same with staff understanding. If, if staff might not quite understand what it is they're trying to measure, or maybe they're inconsistently measuring, they're just kind of putting together a survey whenever they feel like it, and they might not be thinking about those survey questions. Um, this toolkit will be really helpful for them to be measuring more regularly and more consistently. So great chat coming in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and continue to read through a little bit and turn it over to Sara, who can talk about the toolkit itself. Thanks, Emily. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the, how the task force developed um, the tools that are available um, in the toolkit. So ACRL um, saw what PLA was doing with Project Outcome, and PLA had noticed that academics were signing up for the public library version of the toolkit. And so the ACRL board um, established a task force to adapt um, the Project Outcome model to an academic library context. Um, and this, the board established this charge in November of 2017. The task force first met last March, um, and just over a year later, we were able to launch the new toolkit. So the task force developed and field tested the new surveys for academic libraries, um, and that's what we are sharing with you here today. So why project outcome? Um, libraries are already pretty engaged in assessment. We have seen that across the field. ACRL has been um, engaged in assessment for quite a while as well. Um, you know that learning outcomes matter, that you know, being able to share your library story, your library's value um, is important. Um, but especially with those time barriers that we were seeing in the comments, what really helps is to have a consistent and convenient way to address those things. And while there will be a lot of um, an adaptation that you'll do to make this work at your institution. You don't have to necessarily start from scratch every single time. And this is where project outcome can be helpful. So the toolkit itself provides you with quick and simple surveys, um, a survey management portal where, you, where you'll be creating and administering those surveys, um, ready-made and customizable data reports, um, interactive data dashboards, resources and training materials, and a peer discussion board where you can share with each other and ask questions um, to develop better strategies for your own library. And again, um, I want to emphasize that this is free and accessible to all academic and research libraries as well as LIS students. You don't have to be an ACRL member to use the toolkit. So the survey topic areas that the task force developed, um, there are seven, and this was based on PLA's model, though PLA has since added an eighth to their version. Um, and so we, we kept to that limit, and this meant that we really had to identify what mattered, what what key survey areas would cover a broad range of programs and services that academic libraries provide. Um, and this is what we settled on. The initial drafts of the immediate surveys were field tested by 54 institutions of all types nationwide um, between June and October of last year. And feedback from that process was really instrumental um, in improving the final survey topics as well as the question text. So each of these seven surveys uh, measures four main outcomes, knowledge, confidence, application, and awareness, and those are captured in quantitative data. And each of the surveys then also has two qualitative questions asking what patrons liked the most and what the library can do to improve. And sometimes those outcomes from the quantitative questions, you'll see them coming through um, in the qualitative responses as well. So you can get really interesting feedback there. 
So this is just to give you an example. Um, I would encourage you to sign on and you can preview the surveys in the resources and look at, look at all the questions themselves. The instruction survey was the most popular in the field testing phase. And you can see here how the four quantitative questions um, align with those outcomes where I've put the words in bold and then the two standard uh, qualitative questions as well. It's worth pointing out um, that in addition to the standard questions that are in each of the surveys, you can add up to three custom questions as well um, for your own um, when you administer the survey. And that can change, obviously, depending on um, what program or service you are assessing. So in the toolkit, there's three primary survey tools. There's the immediate survey. The example that I just shared is an example of the immediate survey. Um, the follow-up surveys are slightly different in format. There are yes-no questions rather than um, Likert scale questions, and they're intended for use um, for four to eight weeks after you complete a program or service. And then there's also um, the outcome measurement guidelines in the resources, which are intended to help you um, use other data collection methods and extend your assessment practices, including and beyond uh, project outcome. The task force is still working on these, so you'll see more being added there um, as time goes on. So the toolkit itself, this is the, the most exciting part. Um, this is where all the, the surveys live and all the um, tools that we'll be talking about. So this is the homepage again. Um, and everything starts here. And just to be really clear about access, it is free probably for 98% of users. If you work at an academic or research library or you're an LIS student, this is totally free. Um, in a few special cases, if you don't work at a library, um, you get access only to the peer discussion board and resources. Um, and consultants who don't work in a library or groups that want to administer standardized survey across multiple institutions, um, there is a cost because we have to ask the web developers to set that up. But for 98% of um, users, this is a free tool. Just to walk you through um, what the, these tools look like, uh, the immediate surveys, again, are those six standard questions um, with the Likert scale for the quantitative questions as well as open-ended feedback. They're designed for use um, right at the end of a program or service. And these can be helpful if you're just trying to look at the um, immediate impact to inform changes right away. You know, if you are running an instruction program you know, multiple times, you look at the survey responses the first time and you can right away make tweaks for the next time you're offering it. Um, and they're great for that sort of snapshot data as well as collecting um, more consistent data over time as well. The follow-up surveys, the format is a little different. Um, all of the ACRL follow-up surveys are five questions, three yes, no questions, and the two open-ended ones as well. Um, these can take a little bit more time to administer. It does mean you have to be collecting people's contact information in order to follow up with them. Um, but in some cases, you may have that automatically collected like through a registration process, for example, which would make it fairly um, straightforward to send a survey link. And the follow-up surveys can be useful um, for more sort of strategic planning and measuring progress towards strategic goals, as well as just providing additional evidence uh, for advocacy. The open-ended responses, um, PLA has seen and we have seen as well um, that these are really valuable um, and that the outcomes come through um, in these open-ended responses as well as in the quantitative questions. Um, so these are some examples from the field testing process. In the left or in green are responses to the what did you like most about this program or service um, and in the right on the right or in purple are responses to the what else could the library do to help you succeed in your classes question. Um, these are from the instruction survey. And the responses on the right, um, the most commonly used words in response to that question were more and nothing. Um, so often students are saying, you know, nothing, everything the library is doing is great, or they're saying, I want more resources, more services, more hours. Um, and that can be useful if you are you know, wanting to get funding or additional resources for the library itself to have that sort of evidence. Um, the outcome measurement guidelines, again, are just an additional resource to help you um, 
expand your competencies with project outcome and also to expand uh, beyond project outcome looking at other sorts of complementary data collection methods and again these are still um, in development if there are resources that you have found useful um, please do share them with others either via the peer discussion board or also share them with us and we might be able to add them um, to the resources that are available to users so the toolkit itself, this is the account homepage that you'll see when you log in. Um, once you've created your account, you might need to um, edit your account. So if you see that link at the top right, um, that is where you'll see other users from your library who have project outcome accounts, as well as the libraries associated with your institution. Um, and we didn't have the best data on libraries, so you might need to add um, a library or fix the physical addresses that are associated with your libraries. And you can do that all yourself in the account management page. The resources that we've been talking about um, all live in the toolkit itself. Um, you must be a registered user to access these. And these are, um, there are worksheets, there are um, text-based resources, there are recordings. We'll add the recording of this webinar to the resources, um, tutorial videos, and so on. There's a lot there. And please, again, do share any questions or feedback you have with us, because these can be constantly um, updated. So probably what you're more excited about um, are the interactive tools. So the survey management tool is where you'll go to create and access all your surveys. You customize your surveys program information, including program names and dates, um, track attendance and response rates, um, and enter the survey responses if you're administering the surveys on paper. And it walks you through the process of uh, setting up a survey in that screen grab that you see there. It's, it's pretty straightforward. So once you've gone to the trouble of setting up a survey and um, entering all your data, this is it's worth all that trouble because you'll then get the data in the data dashboards. Um, and it's available in a variety of formats, which makes it easy for you to review, interpret, analyze, and share your results. So at the top of the screen there is the overview dashboard. This is where you'll see aggregate scores across all the surveys your library is using and also by outcome. Um, the matrix dashboard, which is over on the right, looks at relationships between the survey topics and um, the outcomes. So it gives you a different way to interact with and view the data. Um, and all of these are interactive dashboards as well. So when you mouse over um, some of the visualizations, you'll see more detail. And then the detail dashboard, which is the screenshot at the bottom, um, shows those responses by survey question. And again, you can filter um, by different um, factors as well by its type of survey and by outcome um, or even program names. So if you're standardizing your program names, you can um, filter the data that way too. So there's a lot of different ways um, that you can look at and interact with the data. Um, you'll also see benchmarks. So as we start getting more data in the system, there are benchmarks that will show you how your library compares to others in your Carnegie class as well as um, nationwide. So as well as looking at data in the dashboards, you can also create reports that you can share then with library staff, management, or other stakeholders. There's two ways of doing this. There's the summary reports, which is the screenshot at the top, um, which is designed to be quick and easy. Um, it gives you a two-page uh, report that you can access directly from the survey management tool. You can also create a custom report that allows you to build your own um, and add filters, add custom statements about your library and other sorts of things that way. And that you do from the report builder um, in the dashboards. So there's a lot of different ways that you can share your results to be able to use them for advocacy. So overall, um, the benefits of project outcome, the short and simple surveys mean that you often get higher response rates. People don't necessarily want to fill out a survey that's going to take them 10 or 20 minutes to complete. Um, it gives you good snapshot data that you can use to immediately make changes and improvements. Um, the open-ended comments we've seen have been really valuable in um, pointing to specific things that users of the library would like that would help them. Um, the standardized outcome measures mean you don't have to write something, write a new survey every single time. It also means that we can provide these aggregate national benchmarks. The ready-made reports and the data visualizations do a lot of the hard work uh, for you. They, you know, calculate averages and tell you um, numbers of responses and that sort of thing. 
You can also work at your own pace. Um, you can pick and choose surveys based on what's most useful to you. Um, you know, start with one and build from there as you learn more. And there are quite a number of options for customization by adding context and custom questions um, and creating reports that highlight the information that's really um, the most valuable to you. So I'm going to pause for a minute. Um, look at, I know some questions popped up already, but if you have any additional questions about the functionality of the toolkit, um, I can answer those at this time. Um, okay, so the ACL standards for libraries and higher education, um, you may have noticed the definition of an outcome is actually pretty close to what's provided um, in the standards. Um, beyond that, I can say we're hoping to work more with the facilitators of the standards roadshow to have them um, possibly present a webinar like this um, and talk more about how it might align with the sort of work you could libraries are doing with the standards. It is something that the task force um, talked about early on. Um, any handouts, tips, or instructions? There's a ton of stuff available in the resources, so please do um, log in and check those out. I think probably what you're looking for um, is in there. Okay, another question, does the library get one account or does each library need their own account? Everyone can have um, their own account and you can also, you'll see activity from your institution, um, but you'll have even if people have separate accounts. Um, I would recommend having different people create their own accounts so that they feel um, empowered to engage in the process. Um, did you mention that the surveys can be administered as a paper copy? Yes, you can administer the surveys um, on paper and enter the data manually, um, or when you create a survey, you can get a URL that you can then share with people that you would like to respond. So you have choices. Um, I know PLA has found that paper surveys get better responses often, that people are more willing to um, fill something out on paper than if they just get an email, but it's um, up to you and up whatever works best for you and your library. Okay, so I'd also like to hear from you, um, what program or service would you most like to measure? What, where do you think this could be most useful to you right away? So if you would share in the chat box. A couple more questions popping up here. Is the dashboard available per institution or per registered user? Um, both, you register at your institution, so you will see data from your institution. Okay, seeing a lot of interest in the instruction survey, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, but that's great. Uh, research. So what are obviously instruction sessions? Does anyone have specific examples of things they would like to do? I'm seeing um, reference consultations. Yes. Um, for a help desk, events. Special collections. Great. We're definitely looking at more people to be engaged in using that survey. Um, there was an earlier question as well. Can we pilot using the toolkit. Um, I'm not sure what that's asking. Um, once you have data from your institution, then you'll be able to see results in your data dashboards and in, in the toolkit. You can also, if you just want to see what it's like to set up a survey, you can create a survey and then you can delete it um, if you just want to try out that process. Sarah, um, I'd also like to share if you are just trying to pilot test uh, how the surveys are administered. You could do that with paper and then, you know, just kind of see how that goes. Um, but you can also still enter the data in the system if you want to have uh, one centralized place to store it. Um, but I would say if you don't necessarily want to report the data in the system, uh, just do some paper testing to see how that administration works. Thanks, Emily. Okay, I'm seeing some great examples as well, um, possible uses of the surveys, collaboration between librarians and department faculty. Yes, that'd be great. Um, I want to point out, based on that, that these surveys aren't only for students, that a lot of these cover areas that cross different user types within academic libraries. 
Um, and so, yes, definitely the teaching support one in particular is meant to be for faculty or instructors. Um, research might cross all user types, digital and special collections, space. Um, it's not only uh, students. So that's obviously going to be a big use. Okay, well, thank you all for sharing. Um, I think we will move on from here and I'm going to hand it back over to Emily to talk a little bit about getting started with the outcome measurement process. Thank you, Sara. Um, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this section, but I think what I really want to get across or what I know I want to really get across to you in the next set of slides is that uh, this isn't supposed to be overly complicated. I talked at the beginning about how we really want to help reduce barriers. And so we put together a roadmap. Uh, this is a resource that we have on the um, on the resources page on the site. And on the next slide, you'll see a picture of what that roadmap looks. And this is just really a nice step through, you know, it's a, it's a few simple steps. Um, Sarah, could you advance the slide, please? Thank you. Uh, it's just a really, it's a few simple steps on how you think about getting started measuring surveys. It's pretty straightforward. There's nothing that probably feels um, totally out of left field here, but we don't want you to get overwhelmed with this idea that you need to take on all surveying activity all at once. The libraries that we see being most successful adapting the outcome measurement model that we have put in place, uh, just start with one survey. They pick one small survey. When we're talking about pilot testing, pick one survey, see how it goes, administer it. Um, if you have concerns about staff buy-in, have one staff kind of champion. It's a bit an administration of one survey. Get the data back, see how that looks, think about how you can make improvement, and then do it again. So when we have our outcome measurement process that we also recommend you uh, follow, we talk about setting goals, measuring your outcomes, reviewing results, taking action, and then starting over. So maybe the first round, your goal is to just get some really um, first round staff buy-in. So how can, you, how can you get staff buy-in and go through this process and then figure out how to improve and build from there? And all of these resources, again, we have available on our resource page online. Uh, there's, there's more than just this roadmap. There's a ton of information we put up here that really reflects what we've heard from the field, what they um, of what they need for getting started, the, looking at the surveys themselves, how to collect, successfully collect data, understand data, take action, and then of course uh, we love to promote examples of what the field is doing using the data. So with that I'm going to turn it over to Mary who's going to talk about her experience uh, with the Project Outcome Toolkit and her vision for how they might use it at her institution. Hi, this is Mary. Uh, I wanted to first give a little bit of update on the, uh, what our institution is because we've got, uh, looks like 68 attendees in this webinar right now today from uh, several dozen different kinds of institutions. So a little bit about us. We are a large public research university in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We have four libraries and about 65 full-time employees. At last count, we were doing over 500 instruction sessions and workshops and events every year, and that's been rising every year. We've got about 2 million print and electronic books that, um, and that's actually our circulation, with uh, 74,000 electronic subscriptions and 660 databases. So obviously, being a large research institution, we have a lot of activity and we have a lot of resources. Uh, what we don't have, when you <laughs> look at our assessment profile, um, Oh, I'm sorry, let's, let's talk about our departments. So within that large institution, uh, we have six departments. All of these departments in some way are doing assessment right now. Um, our instruction and outreach department is doing a wide variety of assessment activities ranging anything from minute papers to full um, end of semester graded assignments and everything in between. Uh, IT services has a lot of activities. What you're seeing in the picture right now is our new virtual reality lab that's in the libraries. Uh, we've also got uh, Makerspace. We've got a Lightboard studio. We're putting in uh, media editing suites, all of these new technologies. The Office of the Dean right now is involved in a huge project involving a remodel and a refresh of our public spaces on the first floor of our main library building, which is about 70,000 square feet. Um, and right now we don't have an assessment follow-up in place, although uh, I would love to use one of these project outcome surveys. 
research services department does a lot of uh, special collections archives local history events um, special welcome events they've got institutional repositories they do digitization projects uh, resource management is doing a lot with our collections, collection development, uh, user satisfaction and usability with some of our online databases. And then our user services department doing all of the user experience type assessments with uh, satisfaction with some of our tours, orientations and just general customer service. As far as how assessment is managed right now at our institution, um, I was a team leader in ACRL's first cohort of assessment in action, and I've been working quite heavily on assessment projects for many years now. Uh, our university libraries here at Western is also a member of the Library Learning Analytics Project led by the University of Michigan. And we're just getting started with a um, data survey right now, and uh, an assessment task force that we have in the libraries has come up with a just incredible long list of all the data that we're collecting, but not really measurement of the outcomes. And so that's that's where we are, is that we've got some of this data inventory and some of these assessment plan recommendations coming in. We have a university level expectation of assessment and reporting, which I'm sure most of you have too, uh, but we don't have an assessment librarian. So we've got a lot of leadership support. We've got a lot of institutional support. We also have a lot of uh, institutional accountability for uh, doing this kind of work. But what we don't have right now is any kind of assessment plan. We're doing a lot of assessment though. We are doing a lot of activities and these are very common and I've seen these at multiple institutions over the years. Um, these activities right now are highly variable. They are distributed across all those six departments. We have a lot of different project leaders using the assessment for a lot of different purposes. Um, these are some of those methods that I was talking about, our minute papers, our surveys, usability testing, focus groups, interviews. When it comes to our library instruction, we do measure learning outcomes because we have a predefined information literacy core competency set. And those are very helpful. But right now, there's in, uh, honestly an inconsistent use of measuring learning outcomes or other sort of value outcomes for our other library activities, especially things like orientations and workshops. We might do a lightweight survey on um, user satisfaction that is very useful to the presenter, but we're not really using it systematically across the whole university library's programming. So our connection with project outcome is uh, <laughs> rather independently, I joined the Project Outcome Task Force um, before I started at Western Michigan University nearly two years ago. And at the same time, our dean was also appointed to uh, Project Outcome. So when I started in this position, we ended up with both a dean and associate dean, uh, both on the ACRL Project Outcome Task Force. And we've both been to uh, all of the retreats and participated in the meetings to help structure these surveys and get them to a place where we felt really confident that they're going to measure the kind of outcomes that uh, we in administration find useful when we think about how we're um, measuring and communicating and advocating for the value of our libraries on our campus, uh, especially looking at you know, this time of year in the spring, we're going into our next uh, budget cycle, we're going into our next uh, fiscal year hiring plan, that sort of thing. So within our institution, we've got a very high value placed on evidence-based decision-making. Um, and, and we are actively developing, continually developing, a culture of continuous improvement. So it's not just about do one thing and assess it and see how it went. It's about this cyclical iteration of library assessment and improvement and advocacy and value. The high variability that we have right now in our current assessment method means that we're not able to compare assessments across all library programming. For example, uh, the lack of standardization in the instruction program means we don't have a unified message of how our instruction program affects student learning. 
we don't have a singular survey that we use for all user services. Now, I also understand that no one tool can do everything. So what I'm expecting is that the project outcome surveys are going to become a frequently used tool for us to do with longitudinal and benchmarking activities. Um, but that we have to balance that with the customized approaches and some of the individual research projects, um, some of the really different kinds of assessment activities, for example, some of the focus groups, some of the community conversations through uh, activities such as Harwood Institute that we're going to be doing, um, that all of those get woven in to paint that big picture. In no way do we expect this to be a one size fits all, but this is a highly efficient toolkit that we expect we can start integrating into several different areas. So we're always going to need that balance. So how do we plan on using it? Uh, we haven't done any of the pilots yet, um, but we are planning rather robust assessment activities for our academic year 2019-20. We've got that assessment committee internal to the libraries that is working on multiple charges and recommendations for the universities on how we move forward with assessment. This is one possible activity. And when we think about those 500 different learning activities that we do in the libraries, we're going to have to pick and choose very carefully. So, and by that, I mean, we could do instruction. We could uh, do the Mendeley and Zotero workshops that uh, we do for the campus for faculty and graduate students. We've got first year experience programs. I'm sure most of you have something similar. Um, we've got that new VR lab and the Lightboard Studio. We could get some feedback on that. We do digitization services and an institutional repository. Um, all of those could be through some of the library services, the research service surveys. So what we need to do as our next six steps is plan our assessment activities for the coming year. We need to match some of those activities for the appropriate project outcome surveys. And already I can think of several where that would fit. Some of the others we might need to do some more custom, but I know that a lot of the project outcome surveys are going to fit with a lot of our assessment activities already. We're going to have to do a bit of training with the faculty and staff on how to use them, but that shouldn't uh, take too much effort. We'll want to analyze and interpret results, use some of those dashboards, create some colorful communications out of it, and then track the results over time and across multiple library programs and events so that we can then use those surveys for benchmarking, continuous improvement, uh, budget planning, staffing planning, and then some of our strategic planning. We do have a strategic plan update coming in 2020. So I want to give a specific example of what this could look like. We have a high school visit program that we do in our academic library. And this is where local high schools bring in, very usually they're juniors and seniors in AP classes to come experience our academic library and a little bit of college life. For a lot of these uh, seniors, this is the first time they've ever set foot on a college campus. In order to do this, because they're minors, we have to hand load guest logins. There is a significant investment of staff time. We do instruction activities with them. We um, do tours with them. And we suspect that there is a very high value learning that happens with these high school students. We hear that anecdotally from the high school teachers. We also suspect that there's potential for recruitment and enrollment of bringing these students into the university. So there is an events and program survey that I already have my eye on that I would like to start incorporating as a follow up for this event. We haven't tried this yet. Um, these surveys just rolled out a couple weeks ago and during the pilot project, uh, it was during a lull in our um, high school visits. So we weren't able to test it yet. Ultimately, I could see how benchmarking this data nationally and within our Carnegie class and also having this information over multiple high school visits over multiple semesters, we could then start sharing some of the feedback, especially some of the open ended questions back to the high schools. They could request funding so that they could advocate to continue the program to continue busing the students to campus to make sure that they've got staff and parent volunteers. We can use it for planning staff time, perhaps advocating for some temporary assistance during the really busy high school visits, perhaps even scaling up and expanding the program beyond the four high schools who currently visit. And then we also can use it for continuous program improvement. 
So in a nutshell, that's the perspective from me being on the uh, task force um, for the past year plus, uh, seeing how these were created and then thinking very carefully and very strategically about how we can start to roll this into um, our ongoing library activities. Uh, Mary, that's that's awesome. I love I loved hearing your vision for what you think um, you might be able to do, and I can't wait to hear how it goes. Um, I think I think what you just laid out is a really good example of how to think about getting started. Um, you're you're talking about kind of one project in particular that you're that you might focus on. Um, you, you talked about how you could envision using the data um, and what you hope you might be able to do with it. And that's you know that I th I think that approach is really great because it actually kind of reinforces. Um, a picture of how you're going to use the data before you even gather it. That's awesome. And, you know, there are some other things that you talked about that I think are really key in being successful in measuring using the Project Outcome Toolkit. Um, there are other tools that are out there that might be more appropriate for specific measurement activities that um, that an academic institution might have. And this is, you know, part one, one of many tools that you have in the field to assess value. So it's certainly not going to replace everything, as you said. Um, and you might actually have some more specific outcome measurement activities that you want to engage in. Maybe you find that the surveys are a little too broad for a specific uh, type of outcome measurement goal that you have. So um, we also have a lot of resources online to help you draft your own outcomes if you want to do that independent of the survey management toolkit that we have in place. I also love to share different types of activities that have already happened uh, just with pilot testing that occurred a couple months back. Um, and you know, I, th I think some of the feedback that we've heard in the field is this uh, maybe concern or anxiety around, um, you know, having the right, having to be a professional, an assessment professional, someone who's highly trained in evaluation um, to be able to use this toolkit. And that's, that's really not what we're, um, what, what we're trying to do writ large. Like this is a really, if you haven't already gotten the sense, uh, this is a really broad toolkit that's convenience level survey sampling um, and so that you can take the data and, and make small uh, improvements, make big improvements within your library, but that anyone um, with an assessment interest is able to access and use the data as well. And so in the pilot testing that we had academics do when we were developing the surveys, um, you know, five, six months ago, we've already heard that those libraries have been able to use some of the data to make the case for improving spaces. Uh, Nevada State College was able to add some sound panels in their group study rooms based off feedback they got from the pilot surveys. And now they're making the case to do more sound improvements in the space itself um, to help give the, their students a little bit more privacy in the library, which is a, a commuter based um, set of students and, and they really value kind of that quiet time. Uh, Iowa State has presented with us as well and they've talked about how they were able to make the case uh, to add laptops to loan out to students um, and, and make some more um, or provide more use case examples of how the space within the library can be supported and expanded. And uh, we've also heard from uh, libraries that have just made small programmatic improvements that didn't cost anything. They weren't asking for more funding, but uh, improving the student facing side of an Adobe program that they had on their um, computers was something that they saw in the feedback and they were able to make that improvement really quickly and really easily. And so you know, I, I hope that today you all feel inspired about maybe an area that you might be able to measure, but also um, inspired to think about opportunities for making change at incremental levels um, that aren't necessarily going to get the library new millions of dollars of new funding right away, but are going to help push you forward um, and make improvements that are going to really Im um, impact the people who are coming into your library as well as uh, improve efficiencies and how you can operate within your library itself. So with that, I think uh, we're gonna 
I think we have one more set of questions that we want to ask. Uh, what's your plan of action at your library and what's maybe something you might do uh, to get started measuring outcomes? Go ahead and share that in the chat and also feel free to populate any questions you have as well that we'll try and uh, take care of in the next 10 minutes or so. So I see experiment with the toolkit, figure out what stakeholders are and what they want to know. Great. Perhaps use a survey, use the space survey, survey my workshops, uh, implement instruction survey for next academic year, need to get clearance from the IRB, from the Institutional Research Office. Uh, Kendra, great, great feedback. Um, I know that Sara can probably touch on that a little bit. Uh, I can tell you at a really high level, if you have an IRB, um, we have been encouraging folks to post to the peer discussion group if they have any if they want to hear from their peers on what they've done for their own um, IRB clearance but we know that it really varies from institution to institution uh, so uh, we don't have any specific resources up there right now um, Sarah Sarah do you have anything you want to add about that um, yeah there's there's some general resources guidance for for communicating with others about what you're doing um, and why that hopefully can be helpful to you and certainly um, ask us if there's more that you would like to see there. Okay. I'm seeing a couple of questions come in, so I just want to try and um, make sure we're addressing those. Um, how is ACRL going to be using data from the tool? Um, we will only be using aggregated data unless you give us permission. So like if there are a couple case studies um, that users have written um, on the site, so we talk about them uh, sometimes, but we won't um, use your data without uh, your permission except to show, you know, on a national level how many participants we have, th those sorts of things. Um, this is something the board felt supported the, the ACRL strategic plan um, and that it was worthwhile investing in because it's something that the field uh, needs and is engaged in in assessment practices. Um, a question about international users. You said nationally a lot. Um, are there many Canadian participants and can we compare to Canadian peers? Um, we're still working on the international functionality. Um, the answer is yes, you will be able to compare to, um, if you're an international user, you'll be able to compare um, to others in your country and then against, um, I think, all other users internationally that will be the benchmarks. So the benchmarks will work a little bit differently for international users versus um, US-based users. Um, okay, seeing great ideas about um, measuring impacts, um, online instructional materials, great. Um, present this information to library directors and other librarians, get people on the same page, yes. Um, Emily or Mary, feel free to jump in here as well if there's anything more you would like to share. Um, we will be sharing the slides as well as the recording from this webinar uh, afterwards. If you want to share it with others um, at your library, it'll also go into the resources on the toolkit. I see Evelyn asked about whether we had a sandbox environment. Um, we have the peer discussion board that we encourage folks to post to and engage with peers directly on, on that board. Um, we don't have a sandbox, sandbox type structure set up, but um, if you have any requests or interest or thoughts on how that that structure might work. We're definitely, we definitely love to hear your thoughts. Uh, the resources that we have put up on the site and what we're developing moving forward in terms of kind of improved content or how we um, present webinars is really intended to reflect what the field needs and that's how we develop 
the toolkit as well. So uh, we also have, we encourage you to give feedback on what's working, what isn't working, what, what else you would like to see for support so we can continue to build it in a way that reflects what, um, reflects what's out there uh, and wh or what you all need in order to be successful in measuring outcomes. Gina has just shared as well a link to a survey about today's webinar. So please, if you have a couple of minutes, do um, take a minute to fill it out and tell us um, what is useful for you. Mary, was there anything else you'd like to add? What I've noticed from a lot of the ideas that people have been sharing on chat are showing that um, the participants, all of you who are with us today, are hitting on a lot of the same ideas that we had in the task force as we were preparing this and as we were creating the surveys. Um, it is designed to be lightweight, easy, something that can be implemented multiple times over multiple different activities. Uh, we understand that large research projects will be handled differently. And so it'll be very interesting, I think, over the next couple months to watch, especially in the fall as some of the programming really ramps up and hopefully we'll have the summer to work on this. Um, to play around, to do a little bit of testing, you know, even create a survey and with something small that you're doing over the summer and just give it a try. And then we can really watch uh, some of that national benchmarking data come in in the fall. And I think that's when it's going to get very interesting to see how we can really use this for some large scale advocacy. Um, and the more that we all contribute to that, the more that we all use it, I think that's where it's going to really hit its value. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you so much, Mary. Thanks for participating today. And the task force really put a lot of work into this. We had a very tight timeline. And so I think we're, we're happy to be here just, you know, just a little over a year after they, they first came together and met. Um, so thank you to Emily and Mary for presenting and Gina for facilitating. And thank you all for attending. Um, again, please fill out the survey link if you have a minute. And we will be sure to share the recording and slides with you after the presentation.